the East African Treaty, which establishes the East African Legislative Assembly, whose role is obvious to make laws for the governance of the seven member states of the East African community. Well, this year in September, the seven member states gear up to hold their elections to send representatives to the East African Legislative Assembly. Well, Uganda has begun its, its internal processes, and as of this week, or late last week, we saw the, the, the National Resistance Movement maintaining their six members. Well, other political parties have gone ahead to choose their flag bearers for this particular race. We look forward to see how this will unfold. But also, we shall pick interest in understanding how are the internal processes of other member states ongoing as we gear up to establish the forthcoming East African Legislative Assembly. Well, to enable us to understand this conversation, I'm joined by a panel of distinguished uh, three gentlemen and a single lady who I shall introduce to you straight away. To the extreme left is, I think now, <laughs> those who follow this show religiously, <coughs> this face is very uh, common to you. Dugulawil, a member of the NOW generation and also a law student at Macquarie University. Lyle, good afternoon. Many thanks for joining us. Um, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure featuring on uh, the Youth Roundtable. I hope it will as well be a very interesting conversation, as oh. usual, of course. Oh, because I was about to ask your hopes. So does it mean that in the past your hopes haven't been met? No, they have always <laughs> been. <laughs> All right. Uh, many thanks for joining us, Lawil. Next to Lawil is a first timer on the Youth Roundtable, Comrade Kamugisha Andrew. Andrew is equally a law student. Andrew, many thanks for joining us. Kindly say hello to our viewers. I know I haven't introduced you fully because I want to give you the chance to speak <coughs> more about yourself and tell the viewers what I've left out. Okay, uh, thank you, Mandreta. I'm Kamdishan. <coughs> uh, I'm a fourth year law student at Bishop Street University. I'm also acting the, as the vice president of the Ghana Law Students Association. And also, I, I'm the acting tournament director of the upcoming UNSA debates. I think for now, can't stop okay, thank you. The only lady on the show, Comrade Nagawa Helena Angela, a member of the East African Youth Ambassadors platform. Angela is also the current guild speaker of MAST. Many thanks for joining us. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Mojeta. I'm elated to be here. My name is Nagawa Helena, and I look forward to having a fruitful discussion. All right. Thank you for joining us. Next to me and next to Elena is Comrade Marco Mona. Marco Mona is a student leader at Macquarie University, precisely the GRC of the School of Law. But also I know he has political aspirations. Well, you'll tell us if he wishes. Marco Mona joins <laughs> okay. us for the first time. Marco, many thanks for joining us. Oh, sure. Thank you. Um, it's quite an honor uh, being hosted on this show. As uh, Comrade um, Anya mentioned, I, well, as dissolved. Uh, Already? Yes. Uh, <laughs> former 87th uh, Guild Representative Councillor for the School of Law at Macquarie University and aspiring Macquarie Law Society uh, President. So it's, as I said earlier on, it's quite an honour being on this show. I hope to uh, contribute productively to this uh, discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, let's just cut to the chase. Uh, Andrew, I'll just <clears throat> begin with you. Because of obvious reasons, you're our senior legal comrade on this platform. So I believe that you have um, uh, a, a stronger legal background regarding um, you know, the constitutional history and how do we find ourselves having IALA. But also we understand that there, that there are several East African community uh, institutions. There, there's the East African Court of Appeal, among other things. But today, let us begin by focusing on IALA. There is a viewer out there who I'm sure has no idea about what IALA is. They even don't know the roles of IALA. I mean, they even don't know the, uh, the, the acronym, what it means. What would you tell them? Uh, thank you for that interesting uh, insightful question. One, IALA, in it's an abbreviation, in full, it's a East African uh, uh, Assembly, Legislative Assembly. When uh, IALA was premised on the ground, before even forming IALA, we had to form the East African community. But you know, East African community had two buts. One, it was made before, but it was frustrated by the activities that were done by before by Idi Amin after the confrontation with Tanzania. Then we later had the East African Treaty that we gave the birth of this new edition that we have. So it was premised on grounds of having a promotion of integrity, both economic per, uh, per, perception, the social percep perception, and also the political perception. So we later proceed, for every institution to proceed or must thrive, it must have arms, like the OECA government, it has to be arms of the government. 
So IELA comes in as a legislative body to implement policies or to follow these things because IELA has representatives of different people. If you look at Article 50 of the, the IELA, of the East African Treaty, it establishes what these people of the members of the IELA are supposed to do. One, they're supposed to represent the political interest of the, the countries they are coming from. Two, they must also follow on what the countries need to achieve in the long run. So if you look at also Article 9 of the East African Treaty, it also fosters on the independence of this country. One, to have the peaceful mindset. Two, to have the integrity and also the sovereignty of the independence of this state. So in brief, the, 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 the IELA comes in as a body to mediate decisions of different countries and come to a common point of achievement to drive a goal for these countries to thrive on the objectives on why the East African community was premised. Okay, thank you. Angela, it's only fair that I give all of you guys a chance to tell us your, your own view and understanding about IALA and well, the community entirely, maybe. Well, in my own understanding, the East African Legislative Assembly is an <coughs> independent legislative organ under the East African community, and IALA seeks to execute its mandate in order to achieve deeper and wider integration of the East African community by approving budgets that are tabled by the East African community member states, and also it seeks to execute its mandate by enacting laws. So I strongly believe that IALA is for us all as the East African community member states, and we've also seen IALA coming through promoting free movement and facilitating trade, and also we've seen IALA coming in where there's conflict resolution. For example, we've seen East African member states uh, having conflicts with each other, but IALA will come in and they'll have a point of consensus in their parliament and they'll come in as, and, and show us they're relevant. All right. <laughs> so I, I, I think in your view, IALA is really so important and very relevant. I believe it is. Okay, we shall, we shall explore more. Yes, Comrade Mark, what is your own view? Well, my view on IALA is it's a very ideal uh, setup uh, that to me has not lived up to uh, the intended objectives. I think it's, it's, it's important to have such uh, bodies in, in, yeah. uh, in place and anyone that, is, uh, that, that claims to be passionate about uh, the East African uh, integration would, would, would indeed say that uh, IALA is, uh, is, uh, is quite useful, but I, I, I don't really think it has lived up to uh, to its intended objectives, and mm. there's a lot to be achieved. Uh, on a more optimistic note, you could say it's a, it's a, it's a work in progress. Mm. Uh, that's being optimistic, but uh, <laughs> many would, would actually really disagree. I don't even think there's any serious progress uh, going on. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Lawyer, <laughs> um, what's your own view? <clears throat> um, I think the closest I've come with Yale, I think, uh, were with Mark when we visited, I think, the headquarters. This year or last year? Uh, this year, early. early yeah, year. and of um, course you, you could get a feeling from the secretariat, generally the leadership, that, you know, um, this is a vehicle headed to, you know, achieve, uh, give answers to the challenges that affect the region. Mm. But from my own observation, the, the East African community is as good as an economic federation, and, and that's all. Mm. Um, the rest is, is not achievable. It's just good enough to you know, it creates an environment for that, that, that nice environment of brotherhood to make the economics prosper. And, and so I think it has done well, uh, the non-tariffs border, uh, the, the easy mobility across the borders by the member, citizens of, of the member countries, um, also the economic interest in Congo. Mm. So, so I think it is good if you want to analyze it only on the metric of, of the economic mm. integration bit of it. Um, to the extent that it seeks to tamper with the political questions, then it, it doesn't have the teeth. So for me, I, I'm happy to discuss it as an economic federation. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, um, Kamgisha, let me come to you. Lawal thinks it is just an economic federation, but we have seen strides or attempts, attempts to make it a political <clears throat> federation. We know that the heads of state have their sort of consortium, which is currently being chaired by President Uhuru Kenyatta, we know that there is now a judicial branch, which is the East African Court of Appeal, something like that. So is it right to look at it just from the point of the economy, but also 
you know, what, what more is there? Do you think the political federation is actually possible? Do you think that there will come a time when we have a single East African maybe head of state, something like that? Or, or you hold the pessimistic view of Dugolawe? I think even from the perception of what Lawe is discussing, it's also impossible. One, if you say that you want to discuss it as an economic uh, committee, it's also impossible. If you look at the case scenario in, during COVID, mm. where Kenya had to strike a deal of not receiving the maize between Uganda, that was tons and tons of losses that we're getting. Mm. Even, even if I would try to take them to their best when they had the East African standby force formulated last year on December, Mm. to formulate and also have a standby body to protect the borders of these East African countries, still it's not possible. Another thing why I feel that the East African community is not serving its purpose, the allegiance is not that very much. If you have state countries, like for example, Tanzania subscribing to SADAC, you have other state countries within East African communities mm. subscribing to COMESA. So there is divided attention to achieve that. Mm. Even if you look at um, the issue of political will that you discuss, it's not, po it's not possible. If you look at the, like of, uh, the likes of Kenya, they have democracy. When you look at other countries like Uganda, where the president has been there for almost 36 years, whereas you, when you ask someone attending the summits, only one president of Uganda has been there, whereas Kenya has had different several presidents attending. So you find that they have a lot that are not in common. Even if you look at the lowest common point that they try to achieve, that is Kiswahili, which is not even achievable at the end of the day. So you find that this was just a body that was just to harness the interests of personal interests of certain countries over the other. So I believe that uh, at attaining the three fundamental goals from the perception of social economic perspective, the, the economic perspective and political perspective, they are not all achievable. What I would think is that they need to sit down and revive on what was the purpose and streamline the issues on what they need, other than hiding the face of the East African community. Yet it's just a shadow branch. If you look even at the projects that they're trying to perform, mm -hmm. the standard gauge area, or look even at the perspective of Uganda, how far has it gone? You know, if you look at issues of as sharing borders, but then there is mistrust, you know. This one is complaining that Rwanda, the recent joint body, they are see, they still have tentacles that look here, Uganda is sponsoring rebels, Rwanda is sponsoring rebels. So if you look at Article 9, it says that it must be premised on the grounds of honesty and peaceful nature. But if you find they don't trust themselves, then I think they define the odds on why they were formed. Then last bit that. If you find that a border of an East African country can be closed for that long period of time, and then the old bodies that are there cannot even put a streamlined guideline or sanctions on a country that does such, then that means that we shall have such vices, people who protect their personal interests over the other interests of the East African community. So I believe that this is a far-fetched dream to be happening, but we hope so. Unless when Jesus comes back. So, so you don't think that the political integration is possible? That <clears throat> can't happen when, when you see, if you're to harmonize or if you're to synchronize things to happen in a normal perspective, then you must share a lot in common. Mm. But other than when you have dif different interests as individuals, mm. then achieving that goal is very far-fetched and not happening. So, so sharing things like democratic principles, yeah. things like maybe constitutionalism, things like rule of law. Even culture, you've had, you've had a, a, a several but of Ugandans calling themselves Rwandese as Vandim, you know, mm. we have had issues of discrimination, for example, in Tanzania where people are being chased out. Mm. So, if you cannot appreciate your in household members and citizens of the East African community, mm. then how best do you think you can achieve that goal of having united uh, in, 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 uh, people or members to force that goal of integration? So, okay. it's very far. Okay, fair enough. Um, Angela, let me just come to you. You belong to the East, the East African Youth Ambassadors Platform. I don't know, maybe to the viewer outside there who doesn't know what exactly you guys are doing for the young people at that level, maybe I'll give you two minutes first to just tell us what exactly the East African Youth Ambassador is made of, but also what is exactly your mandate. Then I'll ask you a follow-up question to that. Well, the East African Community Youth Ambassadors platform is a youth platform and it seeks to achieve advocacy on issues that are affecting and pressing their youth, especially in their countries. Now, the East African community initially was made up of six member states before DRC, before the Democratic Republic of Congo joined, and now we are seven member states. So every country presents five members mm. who join the platform. And our mandate is to advocate for the welfare of youth in all arenas, political, economic, and social. Yeah, because why, why I asked you that is because 
And I'm glad that you mentioned the aspect of advocacy because when you look at, uh, for example, the areas around free mobility of labor of young people, you find that a lawyer from Uganda or a lawyer from Rwanda cannot come and get a job in, in Uganda, for example. And I think the lawyers know of the famous Katunji case, you know, whereby there was, there, there was this legal practitioner who got his, his, who did his LDC from Rwanda, came back to Uganda and could not practice. So does your advocacy actually go ahead to go ahead to translate into actual tangible results or you stop at advocacy? Does the ESC Secretariat care to actually implement the, the, your concerns or it is only a surface conversation or you're only a, a cosmetic you know, institution to show that the youth are also, are also part of this you know, federation but when actually your, your, your work is barely seen? Well, in my opinion, I believe the structure is good. The structure is there, the ELA is there. It's like the umbrella body mm. for all of us all. So ELA operates on the principle of consensus. Mm. If a motion is to be passed and a bill is to be passed, all partner states have to be in agreement of the bill. Mm. So I believe it all gets at the top. If mm. partner states are to agree that if a bill that will facilitate free movement across borders is passed, mm. then I believe that bill will, will be passed. Then it all gets down to the implementation process. You see, when a judge makes a ruling in court mm. and you don't implement, I don't think it's fair that you blame the judge. Mm. It all gets down to the ground of who is yeah. supposed to implement mm. and to follow up. And as the East African Community Youth Ambassadors Platform, we've had so many engagements and we've made so many petitions in partnership with the National Youth Council and also with the Youth for Tax Justice Network mm. to try to push, you know, the most we can do is actually to advocate and petition. Mm. But you see, after the petitions, the most you can do is to keep pushing, but mm. it's not like we have a flow to like speak in the parliamentary mm. sessions or something. Okay, yeah. okay, fair enough. Uh, Marco Mona, yes. let, let's explore something to do with um, international law. I know that Uganda runs a dual system whereby laws have to be ratified by parliament before they actually become you know, laws. So the, 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 the resolutions made at IALA, are they binding to every member state? Or member states can choose to obey, can choose to, can choose to uh, I mean, oblige. Or, or not, because what I know for sure is that there is no East Africa, there, there is no EAC army, for example, that can implement some of these security decisions. There is no, I, I mean, the aspect of implementation that Angela is talking about, I think there is still a gap that is you know, lacking. So, do these member states have the, are they mandated to implement these resolutions? Or it is, it is free will, you can choose to implement them or not. And that is why we are seeing gaps because the EAC member states sit down, agree on maybe a free trade uh, treaty, then you find a given member state closing their borders. So, I mean, those discrepancies, is there a lacuna in the law? Uh, well, yes, I do think there's a, there's a big gap because at best these uh, resolutions are persuasive and not uh, are binding on, 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 the, on the parties. Uh, but again, I think it goes back to what uh, Lowell was saying that we can, or, or at least we should look at uh, this entire framework mm. as a, as a poli as a economic uh, federation. Uh, federation at best, because all member states are acting uh, and are not acting in sync mm. with each other. Uh, all of them tend seem to have different uh, uh, different uh, end goals in mind. You have a country like Uganda where. Uh, the, the head of state is probably looking at a lifetime presidency. Mm. You have a country like like Kenya that is is, is struggling with with transition. Mm. Um, you find that the member states are not reading from the same uh, book, yeah. so it's really hard for for them to even for them to even have a discussion around around having having uh, a, un, a uniform mm. uh, say framework uh, coming right up from the from the East African Legislative. Assembly. So I, I think it still feeds back to what uh, Lowell was saying that uh, we should, I, in my opinion, abandon the discussion around a political uh, federation. Let's let's be honest and now start talking economics because is it too soon to abandon that that idea? Because um, I, I I think that if you have to look at it from the futuristic point of view, mm. then it is something that we could consider because I think because I believe that the, once the politics is right, even the economy falls in place. Right, even the social values fall in place, so we cannot ignore the political question. We must address it, and we must be intentional about it. 
us wishing it away, I think, is us running away from the hard things because it is difficult. So, so we we will not, you know, try. Lowell, do you do you do you want to defend your <laughs> argument? I, I think that talk is sensational and and it makes you feel better, you know. <laughs> continue to think that you know this is achieved, but I, I think the earlier we realize that, the better we focus our energies. our energies, uh, conserve our resources in the right way, mm. and and, and the, the the political challenges we have currently. Um, existed even before the formation of the East African community. But also, like she has told you, the power that, that, that the, you know, the idea that it operates on consensus is very problematic. Even if it was even be binding, it does not have the teeth to bind. You get. And I can tell you for sure, you will hardly find the Secretary General of, of the East African community taking a position on, for example, the differences between Congo and Rwanda and Uganda. Like, they do not have a say in the political challenges that we face. Is it because of the principle of sovereignty? It is not mm. about the principle of sovereignty. I've told you even taking, just taking a position, commenting, mm. they can hardly do that. But you realize that, look at the challenges we, we have in, in, inside as a country. And, and so for me, I don't see any hope of us having a political integration. Mm. I can tell you even if we were to have a referendum within Uganda as a country itself, Mm. You'll have challenges. We've had challenges of Uganda, which are still unresolved. Mm. And, and so the truth is that if we concentrated on making it a political integration, we would just destroy the entire, what is existing. But for me, I want to again respond to the economic, and also I want to disagree with him. The, the, the you know the maze, uh, the, the blocking of the borders. We must realize that this is a work in progress. That we cannot say that because now it's an economic integration or East African community then these challenges don't exist. And you realize that in most cases where uh, particular member states feel they are not benefiting, they will always look out for themselves. When you look at the heart of the Brexit, you realize that you know, the, the, the UK realized that their banking financial systems, they are not gaining, they, they felt the rest of the members in um, the European Union were benefiting more to, uh, at the expense of, of themselves and so they, they they chose to you know exit and so i think those challenges will exist because now that most of us by consensus mm. realize that the political integration is quite difficult it means the the, polit uh, the individual national interest will always take precedent because mm. we are different countries mm. so those challenges will be there but because what is common amongst us is poverty or the need to improve our economy our economies mm. we always find it convenient to work together, you know, to have markets uh, in commerce, uh, even Congo itself, to make sure that Eastern part of Congo uh, has a good transport system. It, it's a country again. So I think that makes us have to work together. But for me, why I badly want um, the Economic Federation is, is in terms of the global trade, is that in most countries, the things of bargaining power is that when you are a block, a, a one block, you can sit and negotiate as East Africa. You have more power because you have a bigger market. You know, I, I feel that that is achievable because it does not have... You see, the problems we, we have and why you can't achieve political integration is because even our politics is dominated by families and individuals. If it is not um, seven wanting to stay in power, the, 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 the holoi poloi of Kenya, the Kenyatta family, the who want to consolidate power, mm. Tanzania, the, the, the single party, the party wants so, to dominate and has a semblance of a democracy that is pseudo. Mm. And so... That makes it difficult for us to have a political integration. But because we are all, we all want to improve our economies somehow to make, from seven it may make sure people don't rise. Right. They have some money in their pockets, and then they have, they have the incentive to make sure that they trade. Mm. You get so. Okay, fair yeah, enough. We want to have that discussion. Yeah. yeah, fair enough, Andrew. Let me just bring you in because I find Lowell being controversial because he says that the idea of consensus is um, is is not a good way to go, right? Mm. But also, he yeah, says that yeah. member states are having um, domestic political challenges. So, do you then want to transfer those domestic political challenges to the EAC level? So, isn't the idea of consensus right and ideal that let us first have issues resolved through consensus before we go into electing or voting on motions and all those things? Let's first handle issues by consensus because already we have member states struggling with domestic political challenges. So if we are to have a political system at the ES level, I think it would be problematic. So do you agree that consensus 
is not the way to go. Or for now, since we are in the inception stages, let us first encourage consensus. Then we are, then maybe when we have built ourselves and we are much more stronger, then we can now move into democratic means of you know finding resolutions and things like that. Which way to go? So, so I think before I also give the way to go, we mm. must know the journey that we took first. If you look at uh, how the East African community came about, this was a white <coughs> man percep perception. You remember when the Germans left Tanzania, mm. the whites unified this, and they had different priorities to why each individual state was on. And if you were to see the past states that formed the East African community, while those states were under Britain. Now, in the circumstance where I would like to take them to the present circumstance, and why I would still say that if I was to take him at his best level, one is that even as much you want the economic integration, you must look at the small things. What is our disparities in economic development? Yes? Yeah. Now, I will not wait, because it's, it's, they're saying that it's a work in progress. For how long will we wait for Uganda to develop the standards of Kenya? Now, if you look at even at the exchange rates between Tanzania, Uganda, and uh, other countries, mm -hmm. it's not similar. And for you to achieve a standard rate of economic growth, you must have a one monetary side, right? If you're using a Ugandan shing, you must be a Ugandan shing cutting across. So when do you likely to achieve that? Then two, you must have a built infrastructure that favors all of you. So mm. if you find even that the smallest the standard gauge rate that have for, long, for how long it has been talked about, it's still long overdue. Look at even the water transport. We have had killings between Uganda and Tanzania over that water body. You know, mm. we have had cases of people saying, no, this is my... And even we have a full act on the Lake Victoria about on who's supposed to where do we belong. Yeah. Yeah. So, now, yeah. back to the economic perception that even know what to take him at his level best, even to appreciate the list that is there, we should, we should just call it a common market. This local market in the village, where we say we are meeting at a common place, yes, <laughs> and bringing beans to bring rice. Yes. yes. Is, is that how you guys want to look at the ESC? You see, yes. through such a lens? You see, yes. let me tell you. You see, <laughs> you see, you see, you see when, we, when, we, when we fail to appreciate the wrongdoings and we try to appreciate it in the perception of what makes us feel better, mm. then we are not correcting or guiding the nation. Yeah, just one more question. Yeah. You mentioned about infrastructure. Yeah. Do you care to, to note to say that this, this, this also involves social infrastructure, not only the physical, the roads and whatnot, but also the social fabric through which you know, the, the people feel part of, this, of the process? Because what I know for sure is that the, the sentiments that have come out for, out of the EAC is that it's a head of state sort of consortium where heads of state go meet and agree on these things. But the Wanainchi, the ordinary Kenyan, the, 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 the Mama Boga in Uganda does not feel that I'm part of the EAC community. So maybe when you're speaking about infrastructure, I think also we must incorporate the social infrastructure because I think to me that is the foundation and bedrock on which we can build this community. Thank you so much. I think yeah. this would be a very good question to have. That if you look at the East African youth platform, mm -hmm. yes, if I would ask on how many interviews have they engaged the youth on a local level, yes, she speaks a very nice point that we know we have petition incentives, mm. but then from which informed point of view have they asked? Mm. Have you ever seen a survey from the youth ambassador saying, how, what is your take on this? So mm. I think even how these bodies are so distant from the, from the common person, because mm. before I attack Ella, uh, uh, the East African exhibit, uh, I must look at the youth that the youth. are attached to me, yes? Mm. How many times have they visited institutions to inquire the well-being, yes? Mm. How many times have they petitioned LDC? Because before we rush for this very far issue, then we must first engage the, 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 the things that build the youth to mm. govern these institutions. Okay. So, Fair enough. Yeah. Let me just um, put his question into context for you, Angela. And uh, I think he somehow read my mind. I know for sure that there is a move to establish the East African Youth Council, which I believe is, is in line with the idea of integration. You know, let us integrate even at the lowest level, at the youthful level. Because I think all of these seven member states, their largest population is the youthful population. So maybe one, um, an update on how far. Because I know that there is a committee that, that, that was established by the speaker to look into the nitty gritties of how to establish and how to put into force the, the East African Youth Council. So maybe an update on, on that would uh, answer his question, but also the East African Youth Ambassadors Platform. How far do you go to, 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 to pop popularize the things that you're doing? How far do you go to ensure that the views that you present in those spaces are actually the views of the ordinary young person in your respective countries. 
how far do you go? Do you do you do you use uh, a Twitter Spaces to maybe gather information, or do you actually have capacity to go to the grassroots, to the villages, to gather the views of young people before you go at before you go to Arusha to to discuss them? Well, in my opinion, uh, first of all, I would like to acknowledge that we do have a lot of frustrated potential in the platform because we are very, very resource limited. There's a lot we plan and intend to do, but you cannot do most of the things because of limited resources. But also, I would like to appreciate the fact that we've actually worked in partnership with the Youth for Tax Justice Network to connect um, reports. I don't know which, I don't know for how long, the reports have been, but we've been collecting reports from them on the yeah. tax information that the businesses and how youth businesses are trying to recover from the pandemic. And also, it is in my knowledge that we do have very, very active social media pages and we have engaged in so many Twitter spaces, <coughs> so many Zoom meetings, so many engagements, uh, interactions, physical interactions with leaders, for example, RDCs of districts to like try to push for things that will better the youth. Of this country but yeah okay <laughs> we we hope that you can use more of these places to gather our views I plus, hope so too. plus the ordinary youth um mark <laughs> let me come to you let me come to you uh, uh history has shown us that one of the aspects that has frustrated this very good integration are personal differences differences between heads of state mm. one when you go back to the difference between Mwalimu Julius Nyerere and Idi Amin Dada, where there were personal insults and, you know, and um, Amin you. referred to Mwalimu as, 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 as Dada. You know, there were personal things, but also the aspect of the territory, the Katonga, mm -hmm. is it Katonga border, yeah. where Amin attempted to maybe cool. capture, yeah. you know. So, but, but, but I think that there are personal differences. When you look at even uh, President Kagame and, and our president here in Uganda, the issue around border closure, many people thought it was a personal issue and not really an issue around, around policy and, and, and principles and values. So do you think that for as long as there exists personal issues between heads of state, then the idea of the East African Federation, be it from the economic point of view, be it from the, from the political, is far from being realized? Do you think that heads of state m must be able to put down their egos and say, okay, you know what, there is a bigger vision uh, beyond all of us, which is the ESC. And even if we have personal differences, we can put them aside, work together, and build our region. Or do you think that human nature will just be human nature, and these differences will just frustrate us for as long as we, we can? <clears throat> well, I think in, uh, in, in, in countries like ours that are not by any, by any measure uh, so, sort of democratic, where we, we don't really have uh, very functional systems, it's always going to go down to uh, the, the, the big men or uh, ladies in, in, in power. We, we don't run very functional uh, uh, countries where, yeah. we, where we can have uh, Strong institutions. institutions that yeah. can uh, even override some of the things that our heads of state uh, suggest. I think when, if we continue in this kind of dispensation, we are bound to always have the personal interests of our leaders uh, frustrating some of these uh, uh, goals. But then I also think it's deep. It's a, it's a lot much deeper than than the personal interests of the leaders because uh, it also goes down to the to uh, to the finances. You mm. you have a, a a country like South Sudan. South Sudan uh, has areas of about twenty five million dollars that uh, that uh, she owes the East African Community. Mm. Now, as a, as 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 an organ of the of, of the East African uh, community, the Yala cannot effectively perform if mm. if if member states are not uh, are not economically enabled uh, to be able to facilitate some of the uh, the processes that the Yala is supposed to uh, that the Yala is supposed to uh, to perform. So I think it's a it's a multiplicity of different things. I, I wouldn't want to uh, uh, to center particularly on the differences between our heads of state. I think it's. Just a cocktail of very so many, many things. Uh, different things that are really frustrating this problem. So uh, I, I think, and it might be unpopular, I think yeah. we are really forcing a process that that we are one not really ready for. Uh, <laughs> yes, because 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 I mean, South, South Sudan, uh, uh, the president of South Sudan, uh, I think earlier on this year said that they would be able to make I think a remittance uh, after the general election. The general election is uh, I think is one of the final stages of the comprehensive peace 
agreement. Yeah. You have a country that cannot even cannot even pay for its existence in mm. in, 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 in the, the community. community. Come on, we are. I think <laughs> we have to be honest about uh, <laughs> what's happening. Yeah. I mean, the law governing the East African community provides for uh, uh, not punishment, but uh, the member states that fail to meet their financial obligation can be can sort of be kicked out. But we don't even want to initiate this. This, uh, this this discussion regarding South Sudan. They, uh, we want them to stay with us, but they really can't afford to stay with us, but we are telling them, please continue staying with yeah. us. We, we, we understand. <laughs> we, I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> it may sound harsh, but we may, we may find ourselves in a position where we have no standards. We are willing to take uh, anything, anything and anyone who is willing to be part of us. We need to be, we need to be intentional about some of these things. It may come off as harsh, but yeah. uh, let them join us or let anyone join us when they are ready to actually move with us. We, we can't keep on dragging uh, yeah. people and, and, and countries along uh, the process. Okay, fair enough. Lowell, finally, finally, before we go for the break, Lowell, we, we live in an era of transnational security threats, right? Even the terror groups like Al-Shabaab, Boko Haram, have become transnational. They operate, whereas, for example, Boko Haram is in Nigeria, based there, their actions are multinational. They cut across. You look at Al Shabaab in uh, Somalia, the actions cut across multi nations. So, the idea of a strategic security would be one that is, to me, stands tall when looking at the East African Federation. But I think that it is, it is, it is somewhat lukewarm because you have um, South Sudan, which is having so much domestic political issues. You have Democratic Republic of Congo struggling with the ADF. So, they are coming into the East African community, by all means, then means that their problems, their, their, their security problems become. now become our problems, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we go about with this? Because we can achieve a strategic security, that, is, that much I agree. But also I think as we attempt to do that, we seem to be attracting more security threats into the community. So how do we go about with this? Uh, um, um, thank you so much. I think yeah. w w when you read in the literature of East African community, they, they have those ideals like promoting democracy, yes. um, etc. <clears throat> but they, they have never admitted anyone on the basis that they have met those standards. Mm. For me, I think again, it is about the prioritization of pursuing economic interests. The idea that Uganda wants to take its things to uh, South Sudan because it's, it's the best market which does not even need a lot of value addition. They take food in mm. its raw form. You realize that our biggest trade partners are, are East African community members. And, and so I think the desire to you know, pursue, you know, get bigger markets is, is why we have uh, Congo, South Sudan. Because look, I think we've had this discussion before, is that why in the world would we admit DRC on what basis? You know, because if it's about uh, democracy, it is you would want them to first establish functional institutions mm. and then admit them. <clears throat> you have Congo, which we agreed, the East Africa, the East, East, Eastern part of Congo is more or less like, it's not a state. Mm. There's no state presence there. People mm. have gone there will tell you there are no roads even uh, connecting Goma to uh, Kinshasa. Kinshasa. Mm. Uh, they don't have electricity. They have nothing. Mm. You get, they, they already have terrorist challenges. Mm. Again. And so I think, again, whether we admit or not, the only reason why we're expanding is because we want to have a, 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 some blanket, a justification for us to interfere in those people's issues. Others will talk about the minerals in Congo to also be part of the global um, trade. trade, which is a <coughs> legal trade to, to say. You have a lot of European presence in Congo. So you also want to have the idea that Congo is part of the East African community so we can enter under the guise of, of East African community and benefit. Yeah. So, so for me, East African community is, is, is not premised on any ideal or ideas or values. Not even security? It, it is about the pursuit. <laughs> it's about the pursuit of economic interest. If it was about sec security, we have a lot of threats. There, there is Islamic State. Mm. And there were reports that they're actually operating there and training people. Mm -hmm. So I agree with you that we, DRC is more of a liability to East African community than it is an asset. Really? Because they have... <laughs> yes, 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 look at it this way. Honestly, DRC has a lot of problems. Uh, like I've said, they have more, uh, more than 100 militias. In the East Africa, in the East, 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 East,
all these challenges. Mm. And so for me, there is, there is nothing East African about the admission of DRC. It is about the pursuit of interest. <laughs> Let's talk about security. Let's talk about no, security. because security oh. is a fundamental concern now. And you cannot, you cannot let let relegate it. Let me ask you. No, no. When there is, you the, like let that. me say this. When there is a strategic security, we can always have a working relationship without having to operate under the ESC. Yeah, I can yeah. tell you, DRC entered the East African community a few months ago, but you have always pursued ADF. We, we, we can always uh, have a common understanding if we have a common enemy to erase these, 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 these challenges. But Lowell, I'll aren't, you, an aren't you being unfair to DRC? Huh? You want okay. to have them in the ESC community for the, for the economic benefit, but now because they come with security issues, you, you think that now we should have you know, a sort of you know, case-based relationship. And, and, and for me, I would want to talk to you as a member of the as a member of the East African community who is admitting you. I cannot prioritize the interest of a, another country at the, right. at the expense of the interest of ESC. That for me to admit you, you must be able to fulfill or match the standards of the East African community. I don't know if you get it. No, but you see, Lawel, no, you, you, see, you, see, you see, no, you see, Lawel, my yes. issue with you is that yes, yes. all these seven member states have mm. actually experienced internal security issues. Exactly. DRC exactly. isn't hasn't had this in isolation, uh, uh, right? Unless, South Sudan has had, Uganda has had its fair share of domestic issues. Unless your is that East African community and, and, is and, like the like so And so is Rwanda. Yeah. Kenya had, had, the, had the attack on their, on the South Gate. Yeah. You know, yeah. no, sorry, West Gate, I think. Yeah. So, 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 these member states are not... S -s Small response, okay. just a, a yeah. minimal response. What is the goal of the East African community? To achieve economic, social, political federation. Yeah. Anything that makes it difficult to achieve that, is 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 not detrimental, but it, it's, it's, a it's secondary. It is a hindrance to the achievement of our prime goal. When I'm discussing, perhaps as a diplomat of ESC, my interest is to make sure that <coughs> I, I make steps towards that integration to to make better cohesion within the East African countries. And therefore, any decision that makes that difficult is 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 is, is, is not welcome. And so our goal as East African community cannot be to go out and fetch people who have experienced challenges <laughs> as those we have faced, <coughs> like the UN, but to make sure we admit people who contribute to the cohesion and the development of the East African community. And but, Lawel, the you best way to do that, no, you can't make a better nail on it. Yes, the right? best way to do that is to you, task. You can only want the the good things only. Yes, Kidega. The best way to do that is set standards so that all countries who <clears> want to be part of us have the incentives to be better. So okay. they can add, add our admission. Okay. Uh, Kagwa, uh, sorry, um, Andrew, rather. <laughs> Andrew, Kamagisha, yes. I think I would like to give guidance to, to Lao. One, DRC is a member to all the East African states. And I think I would like to give the genesis to why, how this comes on board and why do we admit DRC. DRC is admitted on two points. One, you remember the attack that happened on uh, the Parliament Avenue, you know? It was attached to ADF rebels, yes? Mm. So we remember that time that when you seek the, the, the genesis of ADF rebels comes from DRC. Mm -hmm. Most attacks that have been in all the East African mm -hmm. states generate from DRC. So there was a need for these people to harmonize on how to come in. Yeah. DRC. You look at the economic pers pers perspective that mm. also they had minerals, they invest in, for example, Rwanda and Uganda. Mm. So it talks about the issue of security not being attained. If you look at the 13th Ushuru Kano that happened in Jinja, mm. these forces from different states were trained. Mm. We have had intelligence, people have had intelligence trainings from different countries on how <clears> to share and sort these issues. Mm. We had even the head of states meeting in Nairobi mm. discussing the issue of security. Now, even though we don't admit DRC in the East African community, the, hint, the problem is that if they are hovering with 100 militants, like he suggests, mm. they will still hunt the different countries. Yes. So now we must is. go so other than, yes, yes. Yes. Other than <laughs> see, <laughs> you see, no. let me add, other than us ha signing a temporary contract with them, we must harmonize and harness a strong relationship on how to uproot that cause of insecurity from our countries by attacking them from where they are. Yeah. But the thing that Raoul <laughs> does not accept or attach to himself no. to is the issue that security is the prior concern for each every country. Whereas you disagree on other issues. Issues security. that deal with security are prior. No, we can have bilateral now, agreements. Now, yes. see, the issues with bilateral agreements are they sustainable? They, yeah, they're not sustainable. No, they're not no, sustainable. No, they're not no, sustainable. No, no, no. They, have, they are one offs. Yeah, yeah we so agree on something. And every country and, which which harbors rebels that attacks us like Ethiopia or anything, we shall always admit no, no, them. No, no, you see, you see, you see, you see, you see, you see, you see the proximity, the proximity of DRC with the East African community is very closer to us now. 
if you talk about the issues of security and we should be very concerned and keen on how we address them one that if we hadn't approached the drc issue EDF rebels were ready to attack. No. You have had even the issues of no. them being here. No. You, whether you accept the facts or not, no, like you're making it a bigger, a, a bigger no, no, thing, yeah, problem yeah, than yeah, it actually is. By the way, it's a bigger problem than you think it should yeah. be. But it is, guys. But this let me tell you, security is a very important issue. A person who's watching is a very important issue, guys. By the way, you think you should be apologizing. A person who's watching you. No, no, no. no, no. Security is a big issue, guys. And that, who lost the parents to an EDF rebel, is not that thing to joke about. When you talk about issues that deal with terrorism, mm. you must address them with the keen interest that yes, it deserves. But that does now, not... Let me, let me respond to you. Mm -hmm. If you say that it's not as it is, then why, as would, you are making why it. would the country be on standby? Plus one. No, I think as you are uh, making yeah, it, yeah, I, 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 I think you're blowing it out of proportion. You're blowing it out of proportion. In summary, as I as I engage you all. Now, the reason why even we have college trainings, for example, if you look at how these different heads of States have been trained, the CDFs of different mm. countries have mm. been trained mm. to gain the intelligence because one, Uganda is looked at a country that has the pride in the UPDF, that has the, the workability that has been in different countries that are <laughs> on areas. So mm. they seek guidance to sort issues in themselves. You remember I had a problem of Somalia jihadists coming into Kenya. When Kenya consulted on how they should harmonize on intelligence issues, they go to base, and that's why we no longer have attacks. It's a blind yes. man. So we are, we are half blind, blind and we are, you see, and we are leading you blind see, people. Y y y yes, yes, Omona. <coughs> you had a point. Yes. Yes, just make your point. Well, well I, I think he's uh, blowing the issue of insecurity out of uh, proportion. Well, uh, every country is interested in, 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 in protecting its sovereignty and security and whatnot, but that does not... Uh, that that should not be the biggest reason someone stands on to say that uh, we are now admitting. Uh, mm. I mean, what's the cost benefit analysis? Well, they are coming with all these rebels and all these uh, 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 insurgencies. They are also coming <coughs> with a 90 million population. Do they not? Security? Which is which is an open source market that Lionel Yeah, but how, 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 how productive is that? They are coming with natural resources to contribute to the whole. East African you see, economic. Yeah, that's, that's why we're but, having the standby force. East African yeah, but, standby but, force harmonize these issues as an integrated force. But, but even then, you know, let me just. Yeah, just after you. But even when they're coming with all these uh, different minerals and all these different resources, it, even before Congo joined the East African community, who were the biggest beneficiaries of these uh, min the presence of all these minerals? That was mentioned earlier on. There's a huge, uh, there's so many uh, Western groups mm. active in, in, in Congo and are primarily benefiting from these minerals. Mm -hmm. uh, are, are we trying to, to say that since now uh, DRC is coming uh, to the East African community, the West will now cede its claim on these different minerals yeah. and say now the East African community can have all of them? Let's be realistic. I think, we are just I think adopting. That DRC, DRC in that case becomes more cushioned. From who? Because from who? yes, they, they <laughs> from the West. Because now if Uganda America. has a legitimate point on which to say, but no, America or whatever country it is, this is wrong, and we no. stand against it. Come because on. now they have if more I'm legitimacy sure. because the ESC is belongs to the <clears throat> same consortium that they belong to. They no. can now agitate with much more legitimacy. No, I, 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 I think this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. Thank you so much for of, of recent. There was that disagreement, um, and, and uh, the, the East African um, agreed to, you know, to intervene in Congo, and the mm. president of, of President Shekedi was, Shekedi was against Rwanda being part of, of the forces, mm. right? And 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 but but, but these are East African countries. Country. You realize that it is again going to boil down to the, the individual interests of, of, of who is representing who, and to the extent that Rwanda is is. Um, is sponsoring uh, said rebels, sponsoring allegedly. 23. Mm -hmm. and, and actually Rwanda has very entrenched interests mm -hmm. in the Goma and Congo, the issues to do with ethnic, ethnic uh, claims and, and, and groupings there. Mm -hmm. and, and these challenges cannot just cease to exist because you have now become mm -hmm. part East of African the community. community. Mm -hmm. I will say that East African community, as she has presented it, doesn't have capacity solve the security challenges it will go uh, it will go back to the individual states first of all the individual mm. states and the capacity <laughs> to Museveni to uh, to uh, to Kenyatta to mm. Kagame to those individual countries which which arrangements can still exist without having the East African community per se because East African community per se cannot have a resolution on its own and act against the interest of individual mm. states, states. <clears throat> if Tshisekedi says I don't want Rwanda in Congo East African community can't Kano. bind him or bind Kagame. But also, the security challenges are over and beyond 
and cannot be solved by mere integration. And I agree that there is need to solve these security challenges. We should find a mechanism. It can be bilateral. It can be by consensus. Not necessarily we went to by... Somalia under <coughs> Amisom, not under the idea that we own uh, Horn of Africa or, or East African community. We can always have agreements when we have a mutual enemy, especially security threats. But for you to achieve an economic integration in its sense, it must have visions and every decisions that are taken are known to achieving that vision. Our vision is, is to have a, perhaps a complete economic federation, have a single currency, have a political integration. And those things can't be achieved when every time you move, you add a problem. Th then you first stretch your energies. <coughs> that can't happen. But it can happen if you just want a bigger market, 90 million uh, uh, market. Population. Yes. No, well, I think Laura, the question to me is that either we can choose to walk fast or we can choose to walk at a gradual pace but walk together. That's me. If, if you pursue what you're doing next time, so, you'll have so, Angola. Just, <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, just, just <laughs> lastly, let's, lastly let's, yeah, let's go for the break. Yeah. I think one of the people, I think one of the things we should appreciate is that when people are supposed to discuss certain things, they should first consult or speak from an informed point of view. You see, <laughs> one, and, and this we must <coughs> accept issues that regard to security, there are those that they give us press briefing, yes, but there are those that are internal. But when you go back to the issue of security, we must appreciate the fact that a threat to a country can even disorganize the issues of the economic things that you want to talk about. Yes. But then he says that you can organize bilateral things. Now, imagine where I find Somalia is, you no, know, Rana is complaining that we have ADF in our country. They sign a bilateral with DRC yeah. independently. Mm -hmm. We have Uganda complaining of ADF. They sign a bilateral. Now, in arms of exchange, when they meet in the battlefield, there's where well, they have to identify themselves. Mm -hmm. As and when they're not on the same call of the mission, deployed by different commanders, you find an exchange of different countries. You're escalating it from an individual perspective to countries conflicting in our own area. I think but, that brings it out very yeah, well. But, yeah, but, but, but Shuja is not an East African let community let understanding. Shuja mission. Let me summarize. Let me summarize. Let me summarize. So, <laughs> so as, when, it's a they, as, as and when they conflict <laughs> in the battleground, it's very really harmonized when they know they have a one commander who commands this whole force, and they harmonize on the you board see, oh, see, you, yes, you, you, you see, you see, you see, now, well, Shuja yes. is an argument between DRC, Congo and Uganda. I agree. Mm, mm, mm. Why? Because the, what, what lured Uganda into Goma is the ADF attacks that happened in Uganda. I want you to imagine if the same ADF had gone to Kigali or had gone to, or to, to Darfur or wherever. I, do, 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 do you want to suggest that this States should have individual agreements. You want Central African Republic. It's not part of East African community. Yeah. Guys, we can, we can always have entities to deal with these common challenges. Without necessarily, without necessarily admitting putting them. putting the visions of the East African community as, as if it is a parental, the UN, should you know, humanitarian entity. Should we have a bigger vision? Everyone with challenges. <clears throat> should we have a bigger vision on how to look at this? We fail like to I manage the small vision. Are, are anyway. the interventions in Congo as a resolution of the East African <laughs> community? <laughs> yeah, no. All right, anyway, Lowell, just finally, Okay. On this part of security, I have listened to Brigadier Felix Kulaija, and he tried to explain this. And he said that you imagine if the EAC was one country, and the capital city was, for example, Kigali. You know, he said, okay, yeah. Imagine hypothetically, right? Yeah. And the capital <clears throat> city was Kigali. Assuming we had terror attacks from maybe the border of Kenya down there in Kisumu, how long would those rebels take to reach our capital city in Kigali? That is the strategic security depth. All right, let's take a short commercial break. We hope that you are enjoying this conversation. I'm sure you have comments. I'm sure you have views. And if your views disagree with any of the panelists, please put those views on the comment section. But for now, we take a short commercial break. Just don't blink because, my friend, as you can see, things are very hot here. <laughs> <laughs> so if you, take, if you blink, you're going to miss out, miss out on something very important. See you shortly after the break. Digital rights are those human rights and legal rights that allow individuals to access, use, create and publish digital media or to access and use computers, other electronic devices and telecommunication networks. Digital rights include a right to freedom of expression, information and communication through technology, a right to privacy and data protection, a right to credit for personal works, a right to universal and equal digital access, a right to identity, a right to anonymity, a right to be forgotten and a right for protection of minors among others. 
The state's digital rights are frequently violated through various unfair actions, for example, blockage of websites and social networks, theft of credentials, unauthorized use of people's data for personal gain, privacy intrusion, online censorship, arrests and intimidation of online users, internet blockages, and a proliferation of laws and regulations that undermine the potential of technology to drive social, economic, and political development worldwide. It is hence every citizen's responsibility to respect rights of other digital users and to speak out or report to the responsible parties when one's rights are violated. Well, we'll be back from that short commercial break and many thanks for joining us. We hope that you are enjoying this particular conversation. Like I said, your comments by now should be rolling on the comment section. But well, we shall dive straight into the second phase and uh, the gentleman here had a very heated conversation regarding security. And I think the lady said, okay, let the gentleman first have the conversation. I will, I will have the last words <coughs> on the security matter. Well, Angela, just you've heard from our, our, our comrades. Lavelle holds his view and so does Andrew and so does Mark. What is your own view about the issue around strategic security of the East African community? Do you think that having as many members uh, 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 grants us motion towards a more um, a more uh, progressive security agenda, or do you think it is it is uh, depogressive or it is counter progressive like Lawel, uh, Ajud, Lawel and, and Mark? Well, thank you very much. In my opinion, the ideal ESC should be able to actually handle. I don't think we should want to expel DRC out of the ESC just because there is a flaw on their side. We yeah. all do have our flaws, and I believe the ESC <clears throat> was formed with a bigger picture and a bigger vision. And I believe even the current member states of the East African community do, that, do have their own issues. And I also believe that even though DRC is politically changed, we can still find a way to benefit from them economically. So I think the ideal ESC should be able to actually handle <laughs> but the only problem yeah. is we are still resource limited and it's not yet there. But I still <clears throat> believe it's a work of progress and I strongly believe in the objective of widening integration. Okay, yes. fair enough. Well, um, for those of you who drive manual cars, you know how to <laughs> shift gears. So now <laughs> we'll just shift gears to look at um, the upcoming um, uh, Yala elections. And we shall focus more on our domestic politics as a country. As of last week, we saw the National Resistance Movement, its central committee, decided that they will maintain their current Yala members of parliament. Well, what does this, does this decision mean for our domestic politics as a country? But also, um, we haven't seen the opposition, the Democratic Party, the National Unity Platform, <coughs> uh, the, the FDC coming out to, you know, to compete, you know, favorably with the NRM for these positions. Well, so let's just explore this. And Lawel, I'll just begin with you. What do you make of the SEC decision to retain the six members of parliament? Um, so is what, it counter democracy or it is democratically progressive? I, I don't know whether to defend any party in this country in line with democracy. But what I can say is the interest Not of- Not in your own political party. I don't have a political party. <laughs> 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 yes, yes. the interest of- um, of particular parties, how, how do they protect their interest? I, th I think given that uh, they had, I think, voted one of the representatives who had just gone there, mm -hmm. but also that most um, most of their people are really still serving, and they can still serve if they are chosen to uh, continue their mantle. I think at strategic level, you, ha you had more than 200 NRA members, uh, you know, one show interest in being- one, one thirty. Yes, one thirty, one sixty. 160, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, showing interest in running for the uh, the party party card to represent the NRM. So I think to avoid that internal um, vigorous um, um, disagreements, sharp disagreements, it was an easy way out uh, for them to you know just say let's have this set which has been representing us well to mm, continue. Mm. I think at strategic level it, it's very good for to to maintain the 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 strength of the, the party. The to, status quo. The status quo to avoid any form of confusion at this particular time, and like I began with, I don't think we need to judge the NRM mm. premise on how democratic they are. Mm. I, I don't think they are. But, but no, I think they are interesting. Mastered. Interesting how you're putting a thumbs up for consensus now, mm. but earlier on regarding how EAC reaches its maybe resolutions, mm. you thought that consensus was. I, 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 I think that context <laughs> is very important. Okay. 
context is very important. Okay. But <clears throat> I, I did not say consensus is bad. I realized that that's the reality that because of consensus, they don't have capacity to bite. Mm. I, in, in that setup of East African community, because their issues need you to have capacity to enforce. Mm. With the NRM, they have their consensus. They can have consensus for the sake of uh, the cohesion. You get them consensus doesn't help their cohesion. Mm. With NRM, all they need is consensus to have cohesion within the party to avoid the stress that comes with the internal processes. Mm. And I'm saying this from a reality point of view. Because for you to analyze NRM or even NUP on the premises of internal democracy in Uganda is to is to is to be is, is not to accept the reality. Mm. NUP, for example, does not have internal elections. Mm. I have been in NUP. <clears throat> okay. The NRM's premise is how much they can hold on to power. Mm. How can they prevent internal mm. challenges? And that is why they are saying, we mm. do not need to have all of this. They have mm. an easy way out. Mm. They can just say, let's remain with these. Mm. After all, they have been representing us well. Yeah. You know, and, but, but, but to Lyle say is, is that most of these people... Lyle is not actually, sounding like, wow, who said that? <laughs> I'll shoot now in any direction. So shoot again, shoot again, shoot again. Yes, yes, yes. Just for the record, I, 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 I don't believe in the NRM. I just have learned to understand mm. that they are in a mode of survival, survival. and they will mm. do everything <clears throat> possible to make sure anything does not get out of hand. Mm. And if this can keep the party cohesive and, mm. and not bring any new discussions, well and good. Mm. And, and the fact that you know these people, perhaps to them, they mm. have been doing what they want. And I think it is important when we analyze these issues to understand what is the goal. For you to analyze NRM on how much democratic it is, is to lie. The goal of the NRM is to consolidate Survive. itself in light of the <clears throat> new opposition and the new challenges. Mm. And so as long as this keeps the party cohesive, prevents unnecessary internal intrigue, then mm. it works for them. Okay, fair enough. For, for, from an observer point of view, okay. that's my perception. Them. Let's hear from Andrew. So, yeah. Andrew, so, SEC took a decision. Well, what's your own making of So I think to take Lyle at his best, I would say that um, the chairman of SEC uh, wanted to, to, to actualize the point of birds of the same feathers flock together. He's the only person who has been in the East African part of for long. So why doesn't he have these other East African members and the legislative member to be in the same political strength of democracy like him? So to take now that he's very, he does not accept consensus and he thinks that, that NRM took <coughs> a decision, but we're having issues that people are petitioning. Yes? Mm -hmm. Now, if that is consensus, why are they petitioning? Mm -hmm. Now, I believe... I believe, <laughs> don't I, I, I believe have, they, us, have they filed the petition already? They're filing it, I think, as I speak of today. Okay. So... Whereas he's saying that they are, they are forfronting the party democracy, mm. but then these people are presenting the whole country at an East African level. So are you saying that, contrary to what Lawell is saying, the whole cohesion in the party is actually not there? Yes, because yes. members of the party are actually going to court and are expressing their... And, 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 and he says that it's, so, it's, it's sorting out the issue of disparities or dis, uh, dis, disputes among themselves, but it's creating even more. That you see, we are not going to have underdogs and the big and the big dogs in this in the in this environment. You see, we are having where positions <coughs> are in the first, and this is the first time. It looks at uh, the case of uh, the little lion, yes, mm. where they're saying, "Let the sun take on." Yes. Mm. So now, at the end of the day, what kind of picture and governance are portraying to the country? Yes. Well, we see even you had the same statement come from when the bank of uh, the governor of Bank of Uganda died that this position belongs to the Bachiga. Now. When the, the speaker died, you had the people from northern Uganda, this position belongs to this. So as and when the head of state starts to, to portray such vices, then this vice <clears throat> is portrayed at the national level. What happens at the East African level? He's still portraying the same. Then I would ask myself, when he sends such members of such a mindset, what are they portraying? Are they portraying the, the interests of the country or portraying the interests of the party head? Now, when interests of national interests supersede the individual interest, then that's where you find conflict of what you're speaking about of the East African community. That whereas you're talking about the community integration, someone is forefronting on how a company can for, can be bigger at an East African level. So at the end of the day, the problem is not the East African uh, community. It's the party heads on who they send there, with what mindset are they presenting. So at the end of the day, this sets a precedent of what they will discuss and on what they will portray to the people on the East African Assembly. Thank you. Angela, do you think that the mode through which these Yara MPs are elected is actually not very ideal? It is not a popular democratic process because apparently it is the MPs 
of our domestic parliament who elect the Iyala MPs. Do you think that this process should be opened up and let the public participate in choosing who they represent to the East African level? Or do you think that for now we can keep it that way as we, uh, 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 as we continue to monitor things? I honestly do not agree with the system of the delegates that have to vote mm. to represent the bigger population because <clears throat> it's a very broken system in that there is a lot of room for corruption in mm. there. And also, I strongly believe that we do have able and competent young ladies and gentlemen out there mm. who may not exactly have platforms mm. to establish so their interests and to, you know, voice out, yeah, to just declare and be able to be given a chance to stand. Mm. So I personally think that this should be open to the public. Mm. And also, I <clears throat> do not agree to the fact that one party should take six slots. You know, every member state elects nine people. Yes. And then one party is given six, and then opposition two, and then independent one. I feel like that is not very, very effective in terms of representation. Mm. And I think that needs to be changed. OK, so you think that the Iala MP should be gotten through a popular elective process where they go campaign to the laurels and they vote. <laughs> <laughs> well, I believe that, okay, if because we are to use if, the delegate system, mm. I believe the delegate system should be, the delegate sample space should be enlarged mm. in terms of the kinds of platform. We, we can have at least 10 youth organizations coming on board to give us their delegates, but not only specifically <laughs> to parliament. Mm. That's what I would think. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, Mark. Do you hold the same opinion? Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> and, and to disagree with her, I think I think we exist in a in a representative uh, democracy. democracy. Okay, uh, theoretically, mm. uh, where the people we send to parliament represent the views, the hopes, the aspirations of yes. of, of, of of the general public. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so I, I I think whatever decision they take uh, in parliament sort of. Uh, represents the, uh, the, the the opinion of the general public. Mm. Uh, but even then, if it did not represent the opinion of the general public, these people are subjected to mm. periodic election, mm. meaning that they, we always have a chance to kick them out and elect people we think can better represent our views. Mm. And, and and if if we're talking about, uh, if we're criticizing the delegate system, the question would now be, what is, what's the alternative? Yeah. Uh, do you want to hold a general election where you have people coming to vote mem uh, for people uh, to represent us at uh, the East African Legislative Assembly. I don't think that's really practical. I think the real discussion should be around perfecting the current system that we have in place mm. and, 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 and not, and not uh, sort of bastardizing that mm. entire uh, system as a whole. Okay, fair enough. Then my mm. question to you is that, mm. do you think that there is room for opposition in Iala? Because it looks like the ruling parties of these sovereign states actually have control over who they send as a delegate or as an MP to IALA. So do you ever imagine that IALA as, as an institution can ever be void of the influence of the ruling yeah. political parties in their respective... Do, do you think that IALA can be void of the influence of the NRM, void of the influence of, 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 of uh, Jubilee Party in Kenya, void of the influence of Chama Chama Penduzi, void of the influence of the RPF in... In, uh, in Rwanda, do you think that is possible? Or because they, they hold the majority um, members in the, in, the, in the body, then they can always control the politics and dictate how it goes. Uh, well, I, I think looking at the way things are going in the present moment, I don't think that's a realistic outcome that we should anticipate. Because if you have the NRM ring fencing all these six uh, positions, uh, this, these are people that are going with, with instructions. They, they know what to do. And they, they're probably being appreciated by the party uh, mm. for representing, in my opinion, the party's stance. I don't know whether, uh, whether uh, the party's stance always uh, coincides with, the, with, with, with national interests. But I think, as Lowell properly noted from the start, um, we need to start by appreciating where we stand. And where we stand currently is we're first with a party and, and, and a national leadership that is more interested in staying in power, entrenching itself, than probably serving uh, the nation. Mm -hmm. If I think serving the nation always comes as an unintended consequence. The first priority is always staying in power. So how do you do mm -hmm. that? You ring fence positions that uh, 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 for people that get to represent the nation mm -hmm. uh, at, at, at Iyala. So mm -hmm. these people, reasonably speaking, are not going to be are not going to ever find themselves in a position where they disagree with mm -hmm. what seven or the NRM are saying mm -hmm. is saying. So I I don't see us having members on the Yala that are sort of independent-minded mm, independent and are minded. able to, to go head on with 
with their different uh, states if need ever arises. So no, I don't think uh, that's, that's, that's a, a possible yeah. outcome. Fair enough. Uh, thank you. Uh, Lawer, just coming to you, still around IALA and the process through which the MPs are attained, it looks like the, the, the party that is ruling in a given sovereign state, its members still go ahead to become the majority in IALA. And if you're from FDC or DP, already you are a minority in your domestic country. Even at IALA, you are a minority. Do you think, do you think that that is a discrepancy <clears throat> and the legal framework needs to be reviewed? Um, for me, I think it is not a problem. Let me show you why. In, 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 in functional democracies, mm. the government that wins the election is, it gets, it gets the, the responsibility or yes. it's under the duty. It, it, it's what the people have chosen <laughs> and therefore its interests are the interests of that country. Mm. I don't know if you get it. Yes. Uh, and so usually the assumption from particularly maybe the framers of that structure was mm. that. So the problem we have currently is that our internal democracy perhaps is not a reflection of that. Mm. Get. And so currently what we have, even the, what we call the six, <clears throat> even the entire nine, mm. are NRM. Because for you to win, you must be, appeal to, you must appeal appeal to, to the, the NRM. NRM. Mm. Uh, somehow you must also get like, the endorsement mm. from the, the leaders of the mm. NRM. Mm. You saw Mukasambide's Mid election, mm. it was mm. a good DP. Mm. So what you have currently is, is that, as Mark said, that the whole delegation thing would be good because these are representatives of the people. You get. But the problem you have is that you have an entire country captured, is that the legislature, nothing comes from the legislature because of the whole, the tyranny of the numbers in the parliament, they have the majority. And so what you have currently is, is a whole setup of the NRM establishment. So the problem with the framers of those structures, the, the, they make those structures premised on the ideas of democracy. Mm -hmm. my, my, thinking yeah, yes. is my thinking is that these representatives are a reflection of the aspirations of Ugandans through their representatives. Mm. I don't know if you get yeah. it. But the reality we have in Uganda is a tyranny of numbers. Yeah. Is that you have the majority are NRM. And so even those three you're talking about <coughs> are still NRM. Mm. That's democracy. Much or less the yeah. same. Sympathize. I, I don't know if you get yeah. it. Yeah. And so I think the problem we have, the problem we have is, is, is that you don't like NRM and, and you want to have a way out which you will not get. And so speaking of the alternatives, I don't think we have the alternatives. Mm. The only way you can say the common person, tr person should vote, if, if East, East Africa had some, some binding power on these people, if, if voting of this person directly had a, a, direct a direct impact on them, currently the East African community still doesn't. And, and so for me, I don't think we, we, we have reached that level where the countries must have need to inject resources to have national-wide elections for these individuals. Okay. And so I think the only alternative we have this, the only solution for Uganda is for somehow opposition to get more organized. I don't know if you get. Perhaps have more numbers in parliament. <clears throat> Perhaps take power for them to be able to send their representatives, for them to yeah. be able to vote people who represent the aspirations that are, that are alternative to the NRM. Mm. But currently what we have, whether it is an abuse, whether it is a legitimate uh, number of NRM MPs in power. That's what we have, and the NRM ideals are the ones that are going to be fronted in the East African community. But for, also for the for the community's progress, I think it is good because for East Africa to prosper, there must be commitment from member countries, and so our commitment as Uganda is is, is based on seven and NRM stance. And so for for you to have consensus really in the East African community, you must have. Uh, you got uh, M7 himself or the NRM saying that is good for, for our country, for us. So if you voted opposition majority in the South African community and their views are opposed to the NRM establishment, let's okay. just imagine, then you would not have that consensus. So, so it, it, it's like a blessing in disguise. <laughs> mm -hmm. So just to conclude, I think what we have, I think that there's no problem with the structure. The problem is with us Ugandans who have the problem with the NRM having the tyranny of numbers and therefore it's only them who can get their way. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Kamugisha, mm -hmm. one would imagine yeah, that because the NRM has majority members of parliament in Yala, because Jubilee Party has the majority members of parliament mm -hmm. in Yala, because Chama Chama Penduzi, because the RPF, uh, you know, all these political parties, 
you would imagine that the resolutions of YALA would be easily implemented because they are in line and in tandem with the ruling political party's ideas and views. But I think to, to, to the contrary, we have seen states finding it difficult to implement YALA resolutions. Either that some are uncomfortable with them, for example, you look at the free trade treaty, you know, states appear to be, yes, at the fault of it, prima facie, they seem to agree that, okay, this is a good treaty, but then when it comes to actual implementation, they seem to have reservations at the same time. So where is the gap? Uh, I think it goes also back to the process how the East African community designed Article 50 and Article 9. Okay. That uh, whereas you're sending different political parties, they come with different visions, yes? Mm. Whereas NRM has the 10-point achievement, Jubilee mm. may have their 20 or 5-point achievement. So we, we find that we have forces driving in a different direction, but mm. in the same bus. So now, we find that as and when we have an automatic vehicle, someone needs a manual vehicle. So I believe that the essence of us sending political affiliated representatives to the East African Parliament is problematic in its own nature. You see, the reason why the East African Youth, Parla the youth um, Engagement Platform Ambassadors is a little bit successful, though not to that fundamental <coughs> value that they are successful, is that for them, they debate issues on how they see them. Yes? They don't affiliate to political organization. Now, whereas we want the goodwill for our country, the interest of political perception from our individuals, from the political parties we represent, supersede the interest of the national interest. So, you find Jubilee interest has a goal to meet, NRM has a goal to meet, wherever party in Rwanda that is, has a goal to meet. So, you find that there is a meet or a collision of these interests. So, how can we eliminate this on Russia's cocoon of wind? Facing positions and also having the heating of, of arguments. Why don't the, the East African Parliament say, look here, if you're to be an East African member, you must not be affiliated. So, what should be the system of being you, for you being appointed? One, it should be like the way appoint ambassadors. You know, you're assigned. Yes? They, they out of the due to, due to your merit of how you've served the country, the ambassador or the consulate who because we have seen we have seen how people are appointed by merit yes we say uh look here uh, lawell has been good he's eloquent he knows how to do research he can represent uganda but not on political affiliation we shall not go anywhere all right uh angela i'm coming to you shortly but let me first bring in mark mark the aspect through which policies are formulated there is there's is a predefined process through which policies are attained for example in uganda but the most important that I want to cite out is the public involvement. Now, I'm just asking myself, resolutions made by IALA, or maybe laws that IALA intends to pass, do they actually involve the population? Is, is there public consultation? Is there like sort of a, a, an <coughs> EAC gazette where, where maybe the one inch can get to, look, to, to, to input, or, sorry, to give in their views or get to see a law that is being debated? I don't know. I'm just trying to figure out my, like, to get my head around the whole process of public participation in coming up with laws and policies at Yala level. Do, do, do you see it happening? Or these MPs just sit there, agree on whatever the, 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 the agreed, and you simply have to accept it? Well, I think that the, the normal East African is largely disconnected from whatever happens at, at, at the Yala. You find that many people don't even know who represents oh, yeah. uh, the country at the Yala. Maybe that's partly because whatever is done there does not directly impact on, on our lives. Uh, many people, even on this panel, I'm sorry to say, would be hard-pressed mm. to mention uh, even four representatives uh, for Uganda at, yeah. at, at the Yala. Should we try? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think even informative, we should ask the person part of the East African community to make No, no, no. Leave, <laughs> so, leave so, Angela. So, so I think there's a very big divide uh, okay. between what happens at, uh, at the Yala. And, mm. and, and, and the life of the normal East mm. African. So I, at the end of the day, and that, that, and that takes me back to one of the first points I made. I, I, I think we are forcing something that people really don't want to be part of. Because, mm. uh, yes, yes. Squirty I think if, the, if, if we felt the need to, Squirty. if we felt the need to be mm. uh, bound together <laughs> as, as, as an East African community and, and uh, and that would of course mean that the Yala would be more effective. Mm. I think would would act would be more actively engaged in some of the things that are uh, that are taking place because we really can't fault the uh, uh, the ESC or the Yala because I mean they have functioning 
uh, websites. They have, they have, the, I think they have done the bare minimum on, on, on their mm. part. But then uh, it goes to the interests of, of, of the people that they, they, they are supposed to be serving. Mm. I, I, many people really struggle to see the importance of, of, of the Yala. And that really translates into, uh, and that really translates into what, what the effectiveness of some of the things they, they intend to do for, uh, for many of us. So back to what I was saying, I don't think people even want to be part of this integration. This integration. It could be a project of the leaders, and mm. they, you know they are pushing, pushing it. But the ordinary person. Mm. Well, I, I, I have someone here who belongs to a consortium okay. of East African Youth Ambassadors. So maybe they'll tell us. How, of course, I will, um, I will relegate you from responding to the effectiveness of Yala, but at least, <laughs> but at least, but at least I can ask you on the effectiveness of the East African Youth Ambassadors platform. Mm. Do you ever sit and say, okay, ambassador from Rwanda, ambassador from Kenya, you sit down and agree on certain things and actually go ahead to implement? Maybe that is where the role of the Secretariat comes in. Maybe they are falling short in terms of supporting the the activities of the of the of the EAC. So who exactly is letting you down? Is it the secretariat or you are the architects of your own downfall? <laughs> well, I, I don't think we are per se in a downfall. Okay, you are the architects of your own I get to that. <laughs> no, 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 but then uh, before I get to that, first of all, he was talking about Lowell gave us a submission about a democratic state. And for me, I actually think that would work if it wasn't for a pseudo diploma, di, if it wasn't for a pseudo dip, dip, yeah, diplomatic state. Mm. Democratic, democratic. democratic state. Mm. Yes, so that would actually work if the ruling party was actually the actual representation of our country. But they are. But you see, are they? Are they? But, but they think are. about they it. Well, you have to answer. They, they, about it. But I thought about they it. Please. Okay. So secondly, okay, um, what he said, his submission was, uh, people don't even know these people. And that's why I actually go back to my submission. So why should the party give us the same names if a lay person can't even ably give just one person who has been there. That actually means if we don't even know their names, then that means there's even no impact. And you realize these people actually have five-year terms, right? Mm. Mm. Yeah, so I still disagree with the structure. Mm. I still stand by my notion. Yes, and then about the effectiveness of the ELA and the ESC Youth Ambassadors Platform, just like I said, you know, in Buganda we say, Omumpi wakoma wakwata. We do not have that absolute powers mm. to bring into action what we want to see. But the most we can do is to advocate and try to push for the implementation. Mm. But even us in our capacities, we are limited because we <clears throat> do not have the resources to, we do not have the power to okay. have the final say on the policies. Correct me if I'm wrong. Does the East African Youth Ambassadors Platform have a patron? We do. You do. <laughs> Which Secretary is... General? Then what role is Mweshemiwa Jakaya Kikwete playing? I, I, I know that he has a patronage role somewhere. Yeah, is he it? works through our Ambassador General, okay. and then we report to our Ambassador General. So could, do you think that you're being patronized, and that could be one of the factors limiting your actions? Like limiting how far you can go, patronage? No, I actually think that the major challenge Because that we if are... you're going under the umbrella of, 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 of a former head of state, no, then I actually are you going feel... to tilt towards his, his interests? Interest? Interest? Mm -hmm. Look at it in this lens. You see, we have what we call marriages of convenience. Okay. And I actually feel like the East African community <clears throat> should be looked at in the lens of a marriage of convenience. You see, just like every partner state has its challenges, mm. they still benefit okay. in the marriage of convenience. Yeah. You understand my point? And back to the East African Community Youth Ambassadors platform, I actually believe... Our major issue is that there is no clear legal framework mm. as to how and what exactly mm. we're supposed to do. We know what we're supposed to do, but it is not clear. It's not clearly stipulated in policies. Mm. But our leaders have actually done their best, and I still believe we are not exactly ineffective yeah. as you paint it. And, and you're not under any patronage system? No. Okay, mm. fair enough. Just to clear the air. Ndugulawe. Mm. Uh, the idea, and I, I agree, that the EAC and YALA is run largely on consensus. And even you look at the way the speaker is elected, 
there is this whole idea of this year it has to come from Rwanda, this year it has to come from Kenya, from Uganda and all that. What do you make of that kind of rotational idea of, a, of, of choosing a leader that even when Rwanda didn't have someone competent enough at a given point in time, but because that particular term belongs to them, they have to find someone. So they would rather leave Lowell from Uganda, who is a suitable candidate for the role at that point in time, but because of the whole idea of, you know, rotational, then we go with someone who, who may, maybe isn't exactly competent. And what do you make of that? I, I think it is okay to, and, and it's, I think, a common practice among us to these, <clears throat> is it unions? Um, you, you've seen um, Africa. So, so I think generally it's a common practice, which I think is good, that you give particular countries opportunity to take lead as opposed to continuing to give one particular region. And, and I think we would have less problems if, again, the democracy, democracy question, if five years ago it was President Museveni and the next it was maybe Hakana Rugunda, we would not have, I think, big problems either because you have functional uh, democracies and they keep uh, bringing these different leaders. But I think the idea that all countries must you know, take lead, I think it's a good thing. See, the problem with democracy in very delicate uh, entities like this one is that if you continue voting, for example, a Kenyan president because he's more competent, then the others will uh, be left out. I'll give you an example of um, the AU. We recently had a challenge. Uh, I think the East African, the African, I think, parliament where we have MPs representing us. Mm. There was, there was, you know what happened in Ugandan parliament where they fought? Mm -hmm. It was similar. We had people from South Af the South mm. African bit fighting in the mm. African parliament mm. because that because of caucusing, you have West Africa having leaders, and, and this time the East African also caucuses, and somehow because of the, of, of the numbers, these people keep choosing amongst themselves mm. at the expense of, of, of South, the South Africa, of the SADC, South African uh, mm. country. Or Horn of Africa. You get. Mm. And, and so what you call uh, voting on competent, mm. it, it's not what actually happens in democracy. Mm. It is about uh, if we come together, what is our interest? Then we shall continue voting the same person. So, for example, you will assume that that the people in East Africa would vote based on who is the better president. Yet, people, it's about if Tanzania and Rwanda and Kenya have common interests, they can always vote themselves hmm. at, at, at the expense of Congo and Rwanda or Burundi. And so, to avoid such, then I think it is okay for, for this rotation to happen. I think in the circumstances. But the other thing I wanted to respond to... But does it nurture democratic principles of participatory democracy, for example. I think, yes. I think it's inclusive mm -hmm. that all people get a chance. The problem we have is, is that we, we want, we have that manual script of it must be a voice. <laughs> but, but also we must analyze to the extent that even if... What but you, even but if you're saying that you vote, know the principle of democracy is one yes, man yes, one vote. But even if you are saying that that vote is what is democratic, we must examine what works for us. Okay. If a vote is not good for the cohesion, okay. then we leave it and go with what works for us. The problem we have is that just because something is more democratic, then it is, it is better applied. It's, yeah, it's better to apply it. Yeah. But I've showed you the problems yeah. with voting, for example. Hmm. The idea that if you have five countries, three can have a consensus, and, we'll, and the other two will feel left out. But what I wanted to respond to, and I want to exonerate uh, ELA MPs who we don't know, is that in the prior debate we agreed that the East African community at the moment does not have a lot of power, mm -hmm. does not have a lot of impact. And so you cannot expect that the community not to have impact and then the MPs from it to have impact, right? Mm. So, so I think at this level we can still exonerate them mm. because they don't have capacity mm. to deliver because like we've agreed, the community itself mm. is still not out there for everyone. Okay. But I think the mm. element that misses, like you said, is there's the common person. Mm. The common mark. Yeah, How many times do you see the East African community in your life? Mm. Like you don't see that unless you come to the youth round table to discuss it. <laughs> and so I think there must be also steps to make sure that common person. Yeah. Uh, because we feel like Swahili, the whole Swahili thing is just uh, brought to, you know, it's, it's more academic, it's more, it, it, we don't feel the spirit of, I should personally make want to go and study it. It is yeah. that if you want, uh, there was a joke that science teachers before they get that salary increment, they all must learn this <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, that was a joke. But I feel that, I should be able to feel that I need to learn this Yeah. As opposed to government and say, you must learn this Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Well, comrades, our time is first spent on the show, but I'll give you each a minute just to give us your last words on the show. I'm beginning with Lowell, Andrew, 
then Mark, then Angela, you have the last words. Um, thank you so much. Again, it, it, it was a very interesting conversation. Yeah, I, I personally would vote for the East African community to remain in place for the sake of the economy, mm -hmm. because it is easier for us to trade when we have the East African community. But I'm also alive to the internal challenges that would make it very difficult for us to pursue a political federation. Mm -hmm. I'm very fine with East Africa being an economic federation because then we get to move easily, we get to trade, we get to utilize the 90 million population in DRC, um, uh, South Sudan, which, which is consuming our food and all that. So for me, I think it is okay, let us continue. I, I think the challenges, closing of borders, ETC are just those challenges that will still exist even if we are not having the East African community. The difference with the East African community to give us it gives us an umbrella mm. to, to say, come on, we, we have this, this mm. in common, let us mm. trade. And Ubuntu. I think to that extent we have, we have achieved. I think there's more trade among the stats that, uh, that is all to the non-tariffs ETC mm. that we wouldn't, wouldn't have if we didn't have the East African understanding. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Comrade Kamgisha. Uh, I think this was a very interesting debate. And uh, I think thank you so much for hosting us. But uh, in my last remarks, I think these are recommendations to the EC and also to any person who may be watching. I think it's never too late to revive the spirit of why we formed this. But uh, then we must also revive the process. How do we do it and what our interests? Let's be honest to ourselves. If it's personal interest, let's put it out clear that, you know what? I came in the East African community to do this. So as we harness from what we want, other than hiding and not. So, then last year, I believe that the East African community has much good potential to act as a bargaining power on the international labor market. And I think to us as Uganda, we harness from the harbor ports from Tanzania and Kenya, so we didn't even want to risk to exit from that. Then we believe that we can develop through uh, structures of political will, through social structures, and also even the economic structures by harnessing and harmonizing on the monetary association. So if those are sorted, then I believe the East African community will be a great place to be. Okay, thank you. <coughs> yes, Mr. Mark. Well, one, thank you for uh, hosting uh, us on this show. Um, uh, my last, my, my closing remarks would be that one, the, the, the pepper idea of the East African community is an amazing one. It's a very beautiful idea. Um, but I think we, as, as budding democracies, as, as growing economies and, and, and and East African members, we need to first begin by fixing our internal democracies be before we can even start talking about integration. Um, the current idea of the East African community has largely remained stunted because we appear to be moving in different directions as countries that pretend to have formed an East African community. That we are only a community uh, on paper and treaty and all those things, but our actions do not portray that we have a common direction that we are headed to. So this would be a cha this th this. This to me now is a <clears throat> is, is is a challenge to anyone that that claims that they are interested in 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 furthering the integration of the East African community. That that, that the discussion should first be geared towards first um, fixing our, our our internal politics before we can start talking about effectively having people like Congo on board because we 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 can't manage our interaction with these new people if we even fail to manage our 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 internal politics. So, so for me. Uh, the biggest thing is first fixing our in-house politics before we can start talking about growing as a, as, as a community. Oh, fair enough. Angela. Thank you so much for hosting us. And I'll, I'll still re-echo my statement that I believe if we look at the ideal East African community in the lens of a marriage of convenience, I believe we can still strike a balance and we can still work around the ideal and the reality because every system has its challenges but as human beings, we have to adapt. We cannot just totally expel or discard an idea that actually has so much potential, and yet there is so much that we can do in our quest to achieve great, great things, especially in the economic aspects. And much as we shall still face the challenges of in attaining consensus, but I still believe the East African community is a fundamental pillar in attaining integration in the East African community. Yeah. Wow, many thanks. Thank you, Comrade Lowell, Comrade Andrew, Comrade Angela and Comrade Mark for joining us on the Youth Roundtable. This week, to the producers, many thanks for always doing what you have to do to ensure that our viewers get this show right on time and get it perfectly well. Well, I'm just a host, but I also hold an opinion. And my opinion are the words of Kwame Nkuruma. Kuruma said, 
Africa must unite. I still think that the East African region must unite for us to register progress politically, socially, but most importantly, economically. This is the end of the Youth Roundtable. Until next week, same time, same place. See you. Bye-bye. <laughs>